Welcome everybody, there all of you. On behalf of Biotech Nord, Cod Cluster and ANSI Blue Legacy, welcome to our series of courses called Webimar. I am Janita, the project manager of fisheries in ANSI Blue Legacy, and I have the honor to do the opening words today. ANSI Blue Legacy had success in 2016 with a course in marine ingredients. In 2021, we wanted to share this opportunity for new knowledge with our cluster friends and their networks. And we are actually 160 participants today. That is great. The topics in the series are meant to support our clusters work in building knowledge on marine raw materials and value creation from these valuable food resources. I will soon give the floor to Jenna from our course provider, NTNU, and she will inform more about the scope and value of this course, and also present today's speakers. But some of you are maybe not familiar with uh, our clusters, so I will shortly say a few words about the three clusters collaborating here. Biotech North, um, you will see Lena here on the screen. Um, there she is. Uh, it's a knowledge based industry cluster located in Tromsø and serves the biotechnology and biomarine sectors in the entire northern part of the country. The cluster shall increase the commercialization of high value products from residual raw materials new marine resources, and marine bioprospecting. COD cluster, which is representing the uh, MICA and the committee, uh, is a national white cluster with the purpose to increase value and discover new opportunities in the marine ingredients. And NCE Blue Legacy, where I'm working, will be a catalyst for unique cross-sectoral cooperation to strengthen value creation and competitiveness for the member companies. We will do this through collaboration and innovations in catching, fishing and processing technology, as well as by increasing the value of marine products. Competence and sustainable solutions from the cluster will contribute to increase value creation and exports for the connected industries. So then, some practical information about this webinar. Please use chat for questions. Uh, we hope there will be a lot of good questions today. And the questions will be addressed to speakers after the lecture. If too many questions, we will respond after all lectures or after the course in Britain. And we will record this webinar and make it available on our YouTube channels and web pages. And please note also uh, the time of the next webinar. It's in May 11th, and the topic will be quality. And several of our member companies will be talking about the topic from their different perspectives. Uh, now I will pass the word to Jana. She will be our moderator of today. So Jana, if you please can take over and introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much, Anita. Hello, everyone. I am really happy to be moderator here at this webinar dedicated to high value utilization of marine resources. So I'm associate professor at NTNU at the Department of Biological Sciences in Olisund. And today we are going to discuss the high value utilization of marine raw material. And as you may know, the important source of bioactive compounds is seafood processing residues. And uh, along with, of course, the main products. And marine resources and fish side streams are clearly relevant with the United National uh, Sustainable Development Goals, especially what refers to full utilization of the catch the goal 14, uh, life below water. And currently fish accounts for 10% of global human protein intake. Therefore it's very important to, to be used. How, however, this percentage doesn't show the actual consumption. It's around only 20, 35% of the whole fish that is used for food. 
and the rest of side streams and byproducts are not efficiently exploited at the moment, losing a great economic potential. So to increase the potential added value and profitability, innovative treatments, extraction, purification, stabilization methods should be explored and used. So during this webinar, we are going to talk about the potential of fishery side streams for the food industry, innovative treatments and extraction methods, as well as stabilization of the recovered compounds. So the first, we will go smoothly through the uh, web webinar. And the first, uh, we will talk about the potential of side streams for extraction of valuable compounds. This will be Professor Turi Drusta from NTNU, who will uh, discuss this interesting topic. After that, we will go through innovative and traditional methods uh, used for extraction of bioactive compounds. And We'll discuss different methods, also including the advanced ones used for extraction of ketosan and other compounds by using uh, innovative non-thermal technologies. So uh, at the end, we will sum up and we'll take the questions that were not covered during the webinar. So thank you for your kind attention. Please be with us. And thus, we are starting with uh, Professor Turi, uh, Turi Rusta, from NTNU, Department of Biological Science, uh, uh, yes, uh, Biotechnology and Food Science. Yes, I still remember, Turi. So please, floor is yours. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, I hope this is working now. So yes, thank you, Jana. Uh, um, I realized I got a very open uh, title, Marine Raw Materials, that covers a lot. So the focus will be on the side streams. And as Jana said, I come from the Department of, um, is that it? How do I change that? Yeah. Oops. Okay. Uh, I come from uh, NTNU. Uh, I come from the the other part, one of the other campuses, one of the other cities from uh, in Trondheim. And I'm part of the Department of Biotechnology and Food Science. I'm a professor and I have been working in sea, seafood science since I graduated from, uh, at that time it was end of war. Um, so I was trained as a technology, uh, master in technology and I've been working with uh, drying of stick water and uh, drying of capelin mints and the last year since the 19, end of the 1980s also a lot with rest raw materials and I will come uh, back to that. And as you know uh, the population in the world is growing and that it's also becoming more affluent so that means that not only do we need more food, but people require more high quality food. And since the, um, the ocean makes up two thirds of the Earth's surface, but only about 3% of the food we eat come from there. And to get enough uh, protein and also lipids, especially high quality proteins, we need for more that more of the food will come from the oceans but as you see from this um, this um, figure here which is from the FAO uh, uh, state of the world fisheries uh, report that they give out every year we see that the the the, the amount of captured fish is not uh, maybe i can the 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 um, the amount of captured fish has been stable since 19, middle of the 1980s. What is increasing is the aquaculture, but for the aquaculture to grow, then this needs to, uh, we need also feed for them. So, um, and we can't expect to, to get more wild caught fish because there are hardly any uh, fish species that are, or fish resources that are um, underutilized. 
or underfished. So what can we then do? Well, then we have to use um, what um, we have to use what we catch. And not, that not only means that we have to take care of the main product, also the fish, which usually is the fish fillet in the best possible way and make sure that we have a suitable shelf life, that we preserve it well and make it into a way that people would like to eat it. That is also, we, we would like to increase the, the amount of fish in our diet because that's healthy. So, but as Jana also said, 50, maybe up to 70% of the, of the fish weight is um, uh, considered rest raw materials. And I will come to divisions between rest raw materials and uh, other names on it. Um, and as we see that is the heads, it can be the skin, it can be the belly flap, the cutoffs, the viscera, of course, the backbone, etc., and the blood. So the rest raw material is defined as all the edible or inedible raw material which remains after retrieval of the main products. So we must consider that, yes, some of it is uh, uh, actually uh, inedible as well. Is that, okay. John, my mouse is not liking me. John, oops. Uh, that. Yes. So what do we get? And we can, this was, uh, this is taken from a paper that also covered uh, uh, meat, the meat uh, byproducts, but we can look at the fisheries and the aquaculture. And they go through a slaughter process after uh, harvest or catch. And then you get the main product and you get the rest raw materials. And then you get some that are of food uh, grade. Of course, the main product is food grade and there may be some, uh, some co-products that is, they defined it as co-products and then processing and that can still be kept as a food, uh, food because they are all the time having um, food quality. And then you have the byproducts which are divided uh, by law, also EU regulations, uh, into three products. And uh, they are, if, this, if it's called byproducts, it's not intended for, uh, for human consumption. And uh, we have the category one, which is the high risk category that is uh, pets and uh, zoo, etc., and risk materials. So they are for disposal only, can be used for combustion. So you can make it, use it to make biogas. And then you have the high risk uh, uh, culture, which is uh, carcasses. They are not either uh, intended for animal, not intended for animal consumption either. They can be used as landfill and also for safe technical uses also after proper heating. Then you have the low risk category where I assume we are what we are talking about now. We have also byproducts from slaughterhouses uh, where you make food products, also where you make products intended for food, also uh, domestic catering waste we will not come. These are not uh, intended for human consumption, but they can be used for pet food and animal feed. And quite a lot of the rest raw materials or the byproducts uh, from seafood is used uh, in, is in this category at the moment. So how much are we talking about? We could say that, okay, we are talking about the um, uh, 50% of the, of the fish or 70% of the fish, but it's not that simple. If you look at this table, uh, Norway has good statistics on this. So this is taken from the la latest report by Myre Rikardsen, Nystøl and Stranheim, which you can um, find on the internet, Analyse 
Restrostov. And um, so this is in tons per year. And you see they calculate the white fish, also the cod fisheries, the pelagics, which make up a large part. Then of course the aquaculture, which is very important, crustaceans. So the raw material basis is uh, yeah, three and a half uh, million uh, tons. Um, then, based on calculations and asking people, then they say that okay, out of the white fish, we have two hundred and ninety-seven thousand uh, four hundred tons of uh, available rest raw material which makes up about 44%. That's lower than I said, but some of the fish is sold with, of course, with skins on, with backbones in, so not all the byproducts or restaurant material categories are included here. But, uh, and then of this, we see that only 61% is utilized. So there is a huge potential in utilizing more of the white fish uh, byproducts or restaurant materials. This is probably due to this is caught at sea, and there the boats don't have the capacity or the they are not made to to take care of all the side streams on board. They want to take care of the main product mainly. So now I'm uh, and as you realize, I'm a food scientist. I'm not. Uh, marketing person. But when you look at the pelagics, there you see that only 194,000 tons are available as rest raw material, which makes up only 15% of the fish weight. And of this, all is used mainly for fish meal. But why such a low percentage? Is it because there is so little rest raw materials in the pelagics? No. That is because lots and uh, the la a large fraction of this goes out of the country ungutted, or maybe only gutted. So that if we processed more of the pelagics, mackerel and herring, etc., in Norway, we would have a larger proportion of rest raw materials generated here and could utilize it here. So that's also a potential to do more of the processing, I know, uh, so at home at, in Norway, and then get uh, available restaurant material. For the aquaculture, we have about 30% that is restaurant material, and 93% of it is used. Uh, but what is not used is the blood, which is difficult to collect because uh, it's bled out in water. But again, it's mainly used not for human consumption. Then we have the crustaceans, where the uh, byproducts or the restaurant material make up about a little less than 30%, and about 51% is used. And that is also challenging because you have all the, the shell, but somebody will talk about this uh, uh, later. So what is it used for? Sorry, this is uh, in Norwegian. We see that it's used for fish meal and fish oil. Then it's used for silage, which is a large part. Then it is uh, used for fur animals. That will stop as the, 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 the fur animals business is, uh, production is stopped in Norway. And then you have oil and protein production based on fresh raw materials from the aquaculture business. Then you have seafood products and then uh, also some um, uh, cod liver oil and extracts. Um, Iceland has a long tradition of being very good in utilizing the rest raw materials. So when we first started working with the rest raw materials, we, it was on national products, projects and then Nordic projects together with, uh, with Iceland. And for them, the cod and the cod fisheries are uh, important. 
And they said that, okay, the fillets here makes up only 44% of the fish, and then the rest head cutoffs, etc., make up the rest of the of the restaurant of the of the fish. But they say, okay, okay, the fresh and the chilled fish make up about 40%. Uh, of the, the value, then you have the frozen at land, frozen at sea, and salted. And then they sell dried heads and also others, which also make up a part of, the, of, the, of their export value. So what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, heads, collarbones, cutoffs, skin, backbone, row, liver, bile, viscera, shell, etc. Uh, and we can make them also, of course, the, from the processing, we get all these conventional uh, products, and then we get all these rest raw materials. And what can we use them for? We can use them for conventional products, but we can also, but not all can be used as conventional products. So some, uh, there is the, a large potential to then, uh, 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 use it for other products. And I thought I would just take a little uh, time to just look a little bit back on, uh, on uh, what we have done. And earlier uh, we used, we were in, in the really old age, we were good at using this. Um, we used uh, them, the skins for windows and for clothing and for shoes to put under our skis when we were skiing, and the heads were used for fertilizer and for feed, even if some of this feed was rather not so digestible for, for, for instance, uh, uh, cattle and other livestock. The, and then the, bad, the byproducts, they had to be used. We couldn't afford to throw anything out. So this was regulated by law as far back as the 1600s. And fish heads were dried for fertilizers. And then fresh fish, at that time, it was probably called waste, was used for animals. And it could also be used to give flavor. And then it was considered waste for, also it's, this is what you can use it for. And then when did this change? In Norway, you could say that this changed in the 1970s, where um, then there was this, when with the increase in the aquaculture business, then, uh, or the aquaculture industry, then you had a lot of restaurant materials and they were generated on land, on shore, so that they couldn't just be thrown uh, out. So what could we do? What, could we, or what did we have to do with this? And then, um, uh, yeah, I will come back to that in a, in a minute. And then when we started working on this byproducts, it was called then, uh, we, um, uh, the challenge when you went to uh, conferences to present the results, it was that, in other countries, further south in Europe, it was still called fish waste. And this is still a challenge today, that it's called waste. And also you can see it in EU courts that it is called waste. And that is a problem because as long as you call it waste, then you treat it as waste and you are not treating it as the valuable raw material that it really is. And I have listed what can we make from this? Yeah, well, we can make biogas and biodiesel, but that it should only be these restaurant materials uh, or these products that we can't use for anything else and fertilizer. And then we come to feed and feed ingredients where a lot of it goes today. Pet food, also a valuable market. And then restaurant materials for direct human consumption. And then we have ingredients and foods and nutraceuticals, then we are into, they have to be treated as food all the time. So for animal feel, then we have fish meal and oil. And this is important because after all, then 
this uh, material then goes back into making food for us. We lose, of course, quite a lot of the energy, but it is used to produce food. So it's not wasted. So silage was what the Norwegians came up with, that this was the way to, to, um, to produce, uh, um, uh, to take care of all the rest raw material from the aquaculture industry, lower the, the pH, and then let the endogenous enzymes in the raw material work, and then um, we get oil and protein, which then can be used for feed only. Then we have this, which I guess many of you have eaten, cod um, tongues, which is in season now, and cod medallions from the cheek of the uh, cod. Also, the heads are dried and uh, has been a large, fairly large market, but it's it's varying a lot. Then we have the cod roe, which is, and the cod liver, which is in high season now, and then also some swim bladder, back fillet, stomachs, etc., and meat and means can be can be uh, can be sold. But so uh, but, so that was for direct human consumption. Of course, then it has to be taken care of and and treated as food. Then um, I'm going to to talk a little bit about the valuable compounds in rest raw materials, which are the proteins, which you could say are gelatin, collagen, and proteins and peptides. The gelatin protein is in a group by itself because it's a special group of proteins. Then we have the lipids, which somebody will talk about, minerals, enzymes, there's been a lot of discussion about that, and chitin and chitosan from the crustaceans. And then if we look at this from, from the, for the proteins, of course, we have the most highly prized ones at the top, but uh, these also requires the most processing and refining and uh, the, are the strictest regulations to prove that these are really uh, working. So what are the big challenges here? That the composition of the rest raw material varies over a wide range. It varies with the species, whether it's a fatty species or a lean species. Um, it varies with what fractions you have, whether you have the head or the backbone or the skin. Um, um, and the may, uh, many, you could be tempted to say most of the rest raw materials are highly perishable with a high enzymatic activity, also could have a high microbial load, but the enzymatic activity is, uh, is the most important one. And there, um, there is a need for rapid preservation. Some sort of preservation, maybe into bulk products for further refining at uh, more um, at other larger processing plants. So you have different species, different fractions, and different companies. And the main aim is to optimize the yield and properties of the, the ingredients that you extract. So we have different contents of proteins, etc. And what do we want out of the, of the ingredients that we extract? Do you want the water holding, the, the functional properties to contribute to that into food? Um, do we want it to have biological activity? Is that important to be an antioxidant, to be able to lower the blood pressure? Then you have a challenge with the taste, which is also something that we need to work on. How can we optimize the other properties when reducing the fishy taste? Sorry, so there. So, in my opinion, <laughs> some of the, the uh, uh, challenges is in sorting, that you should sort the highly perishable, also the viscera, the most unstable fractions from the other. And then you could use, make better products or better ingredients if you sorted the, the, the fractions. Yeah, so then it could be possible to make uh, all these specialized products, to have a stable raw material, a more specified raw material into your process, which is something that 
uh, is not the, the case in many productions today. So the problem were that to end up with, with this is to say that, okay, uh, and it is, you can never retrieve, sorry, I've been teaching for many years, so you can never retrieve lost quality. So the best raw material gives the, uh, the, the best raw, uh, the best product. So the quality of the raw material, the quality and the composition of the raw material will affect the quality of the products. So you need to retain the quality. And this is a challenge in utilizing uh, side streams. I think that was what I had, yes. Okay. Yes, I think thank that you, was it. You. Yes. Thank you very much, Turi, for such an interesting presentation. I was really into this. So uh, you you really have a huge experience, and actually I learned a lot by by working with you. So and now I'm actually I just wanted to to mention just um, last week I was teaching this as well, like uh, first category, second and third category according to Matilcina because I'm teaching for Norwegian students, and um, yes. And I, I first I want to ask uh, Anita if we have um, any questions from the audience in the chat, so we will address those questions. Hmm. Yes, we have a question and thank you uh, to it for a very nice presentation that really gives an overview of all uh, the possibilities for using restroom materials. Um, this is from uh, there's a question to you from uh, Temis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting and relevant presentation to it. We are working on finding better ways of communicating waste, rest, by plus products mm -hmm. and materials. What would be your suggestion for a better new way to call this valuable material? Uh, I think uh, what your colleague in Nofimain or in Bergen has started calling it co-products um, uh, and uh, also, uh, rest raw material is is probably one way. Co-products is is another way because um, I think it's really and also uh, I, I this that okay it, it's for for the fish because people are into this that the fisheries should be fisheries and aquaculture should be sustainable and they are really into this that. Um, we use like there as aquaculture is a lot of feed used and and maybe if we find they people find out that okay a lot of the white fish is going out unused so this is that this that okay this co-products restaurant materials uh, is a valuable product that is fitted for human consumption is kind of the message but I'm not an expert in this but Waste is definitely not the way to, to go. And I think restaurant materials and co-products are much better than byproducts as well. And since now byproducts is used by the food authorities also, so yeah. Do we have other questions? Uh, no, but there are time. Yes, there came a new question from uh, Jessica Gomez. A uh, very informative presentation. Thank you, Turid. Uh, I was wondering, or she's wondering, for research pur purposes, how easy is it to obtain restroom materials from companies for use in academic research? Um, she's <laughs> carrying out research in the UK, so perhaps this is different than in other yeah. countries. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, in Norway, I would say it is not a problem. And I guess in all of you have the same. Also, mm -hmm. um, uh, there are several of the of the um, Norwegian uh, fish producers, uh, salmon producers that that see the benefit in in working together with academia to to uh, also both in research projects, but also in having students um, also cooperating on uh, on master projects. So uh, 
so I haven't really experienced that as a problem, uh, no. And I guess, uh, but that that's probably could be different in uh, in Norway. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, it was coming up a new uh, message. So so from so so from Sophie. Yes. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Sophie Kendler, thanking. Yeah. Thank you for interesting talk. How would you rate the possibilities of rest raw material from flatfish related to the? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that is for you to find out, Sophie. But um, uh, I, I guess also what is one of the challenges is that uh, you need to have. Also, for, for a company to be um, interested in producing ingredients from restaurant materials and utilizing the restaurant materials, then you would need to have a stable supply. So uh, you have to have a certain amount for somebody to be willing to set up uh, um, a processing of that, unless you could use and say, okay, today we process from flatfish, but then you need to be able to collect enough to have one processing uh, the plant to uh, run on that. So I would guess it depends on the amount. Mm. <laughs> Any more questions coming up? No, I think that is it, uh, Turet. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Turi. Yeah, it was really interesting talk. And uh, I also remind something, it reminds us of something also important to me. So uh, I think I can uh, I can uh, uh, continue with the talk and uh, talk about uh, innovative technologies and traditional technologies used for extraction of viable compounds. So I'm going to share my screen now to everyone. And uh, yes, oh, sorry. So uh, today I'm going to talk about traditional and innovative technologies uh, methods used for extraction of bioactive compounds from marine uh, raw materials and size streams. And uh, also to display very similar table, the, the, the same as actually Turit has displayed on food recovery hierarchy. So the most preferred now for us is, of course, direct prevention of, uh, of food losses and side streams and production of food for people. And uh, after that goes feed for animals and industrial chemicals. So it's very important for us to recover valuable compounds from fish side streams and to use also fish oil and bioproducts for animal uh, consumption. If, for example, we cannot treat them, if they belong to, for example, category two or three, I just, uh, it just remind me, the presentation of Turi remind me what kind of categories we have. So um, the product pyramid for fishery biocatches and processing discards uh, shows the great potential uh, as a market potential for pharmaceuticals, cosmeceuticals, and nutraceuticals. So we actually want to produce them in, uh, in higher amounts. Uh, and, um, but the problem here is that we have limited resources. So for the pharmaceuticals, cosmeceuticals, and some functional food, the resource availability is uh, limited or fair. But if we go down to uh, normal food products, feed and bioenergy, then we have very good resource availability, but less, uh, less potential market value. So it's, it's a challenge now to, to find the balance between the resource availability and potential market value. So uh, we need to, therefore we need to think about what influences? Yes, of course, I totally agree with Turi that in order to produce uh, and to extract high value compounds, we need to use fresh raw material or rest raw materials that uh, doesn't belong to bioproducts categories two or three years. Yes. 
and uh, and then we need to, to handle it properly. So the quality of uh, restro material is very important. But uh, maybe we can somehow uh, increase the value of our ingredients, uh, of our bioproducts by using innovative technologies, because this is what we are dealing with. Uh, science uh, should not stay on the same place. It should be always be in the development. So the bioproduct availability now uh, is, uh, is huge and we have huge potential also from, uh, from the biocatch. So we have high value bioproducts that could be used for, uh, for, uh, for, um, uh, for, for, uh, to extract uh, high value uh, ingredients such as uh, oil uh, or um, hydrolysis or bioactive peptides. So, and if we, we are looking at um, non-food uses, they are gradually going down, but the capture for human consumption is increasing uh, along with the aquaculture for uh, human consumption. So we need to find innovative methods to exploit um, the, the, high, uh, to the high potential of, um, of this bio, of this um, uh, restaurant materials. So if we look at traditional production of crude marine oils and also hydrolysis, this is part of, uh, of enzymatic hydrolysis, then we have uh, the main processing steps as cooking, enzyme treatment, processing and centrifugation and separation. And this is very, how to say, traditional method uh, and very good method. So here, uh, what we can do is just to play with um, cooking temperature, some parameters, yes, uh, concentration of enzymes, type of enzymes, which is also very important. And we tried in, in the lab also so many enzymes and they gave so different results actually with um, for the same raw material. And uh, okay, pressing and centrifugation, of course, we can also uh, play with the speed of centrifugation and time. And also we got different results for the oil extracted and for for the, uh, for the amount of water-soluble proteins that uh, is part of um, hydrolysis. And also separation techniques uh, are different. And also you can, uh, you can use uh, uh, microfiltration. So, but this is um, just uh, a part of traditional production. So uh, of course, if we play with different enzymes, then we can use uh, a big range of different proteases that will um, cleave the, the muscle and the assembly and the myofibril complex to obtain uh, short chain peptides. And also uh, we can use uh, collagenases or, or other, uh, or, or sorry, or other um, uh, enzymes to degrade uh, collagen and elastin to, to have more uh, concentrated, um, uh, hyd hy more concentrated hy hydrolysate uh, and, uh, and better yield. But this is also a part of the traditional uh, method used. So what we are basically doing also in the lab is that we are taking fish bioproducts uh, or, or restaurant materials, depends where we are going to use them, of course, further. We green them, uh, produce uh, bioproduct means, and then uh, perform enzymatic enzyma hydrolysis with further thermal inactivation and centrifugation. So after that, we get the oil phase on the top, uh, then the water phase is protein fraction, water soluble proteins, uh, and residues that is um, uh, that is can be used as fertilizer for further. So we are most interested in fish oil and protein hydrolysate. And what we can, as I mentioned before, what we can do here and we did before in the lab is just to play with the concentration of enzymes, with enzymes, type of enzymes, which is very important, and some um, physical parameters. So this is the, the way how we are doing this in the lab. So we take, uh, usually we take uh, salmon um, mince and add uh, warm water with uh, enzymes and perform hydrolysis. Uh, yes, we are also playing with time. 
uh, to, to see the difference. After hydrolysis, uh, we centrifuge the, the soup that we are calling uh, to, uh, to obtain three fractions. Uh, but uh, to be honest, there are not three. Uh, many times we have also emulsion uh, between the water soluble proteins and the oil. Here we have really good separation, as you can see. So there is uh, uh, almost no emulsion. And after that, we uh, freeze dry the um, uh, hydrolysis, hydrolysates, uh, and also freeze dry end products as sediments and uh, separate oil. Uh, so, how can we uh, actually uh, increase the um, and optimize, increase the yield and optimize this traditional uh, method for extraction? So, we have actually three main stages. So, we can optimize and develop a new methods for preservation, right? The preservation of uh, restraw materials. So, for example, to so yes, it's it's really hard. It's really hard. I totally agree with Turi that if we already have low quality raw material, but if we have a good quality raw material, we can do something to preserve for further extraction. Uh, then we can use innovative technologies such as, for example, uh, treatment with uh, cold uh, plasma treated water or uh, high pressure processing to decrease uh, the um, microbial um, growth, uh, also modified atmosphere packaging and other uh, also super chilling technology can be used here. Uh, but the most important for us uh, is of course optimization of existing method of extraction. So here we can play a lot and I'm going to talk more about this. So uh, if we, uh, introduce innovative treatments before the hydrolysis, uh, thus can we increase the yield of oil or proteins, depending on, on uh, our process, of course, uh, and uh, to uh, decrease the, the temperature of uh, hydrolysis, uh, and thus to preserve more of bioactive fractions of the uh, biological active peptides. And then the third step here is to valorize the fishery side streams in the food uh, and feed industries. Uh, so here if we have good uh, bioactive ingredients, we can uh, develop more functional foods. Uh, that is uh, very profitable also for the, for the food industry. So the optimization of lipid and protein uh, extraction, uh, extraction from the seafood restaurant materials include two main, um, let's say, stages, yes. The first is to take care of the quality of extracted lipids and proteins. And here we can uh, look at raw material quality and composition, storage and handling, processing methods, antioxidant addition or nitrogen addition. We also played with this in the lab. And optimization sh uh, steps should include sorting and logistics. It's very important to, to separate different fractions uh, to have uh, better yield and uh, better preservation of bioactive compounds of peptides and lipids, preservation of the raw material, uh, extraction and processing of fractions by using novel technologies and stabilization of the fractions. Of course, this is very important. So uh, here, what kind of methods we can use to improve the extraction uh, by using innovative technologies? So uh, we have a main non-thermal technologies that um, are used now in Europe. This is high pressure processing, pulsed electric field, supercritical extraction, ultrasound, and microwave assisted extraction. I'm going to talk in detail about the, um, the technologies that I have personally tried and we are trying with our project partners. 
and that showed really good potential for further improvement and application for our, our enzymatic hydrolysis. Yes, so the, the most um, important idea here is that usually the conventional enzymatic hydrolysis requires higher temperature for inactivation of endogenous enzymes. Yes, during pretreatments, if we do need to inactivate, but if we need to control the enzymatic hydrolysis and to use commercial enzymes, it's also wise to inactivate first endogenous enzymes. And we are using high temperature to do this. Yes, but if we apply, if we use high temperatures, of course, we can lose uh, some of the bioactive properties, which is not good for us. So therefore, it's wise to, uh, to apply innovative technologies as pretreatment prior to enzymatic hydrolysis to inactivate those endogenous enzymes in the raw material and thus preserving the nutritional value of bioactive compounds uh, such as um, lipids and proteins. So we have the same scheme, yes, so we have residual biomass or, or restroom materials. And prior to extraction and purification, we can use pretreatment. So we can use non-thermal technologies, uh, electromagnetic uh, technologies, and biotechno biotechnological treatments. And then we can extract uh, bioactive compounds such as proteins, peptides, lipids, and also ketin. Silva is going to talk about this more in detail today and to use them for nutraceutical food and performance chemicals, yes. So thus we will improve the quality of extracted compounds, ensure better valorization uh, of the bioproducts or restroom materials, will reduce the energy and water consumption Yes, this is for sure. If we don't apply thermal uh, pretreatment and uh, employ new intervention for developing new food products. So uh, one of the methods that we tried and still trying now is the high pressure processing. So high pressure processing is a cold pasteurization technique by which food products sealed in uh, in a package like a vacuum package I introduced into a vessel and subjected to a high level of uh, isostatic pressure transmitted by water. Yes, so what happens during this is that uh, if we look at the um, uh, muscle, at the, at the part of the fish muscle, yes, packed in a vacuum package and load into the um, uh, vessel with water, then under the high pressure of, we, we are usually using from 300 to 600 megapascal, but uh, can we use, we can also use higher. Uh, we have formation of small pores uh, in, in the raw material under the pressure and extraction of pressurized material. What does it give to us? So first of all, since uh, enzymes are also proteins and will degrade under the high pressure, we can inactivate endogenous enzymes. Uh, and also, uh, we can start to uh, cleave our uh, muscle to, to release more oil and protein if we need, if we need. I will explain further why we need this. Uh, and before we tried high pressure treatment also to fish minces, it was a, a um, pro-health project with uh, Turi Rusta and, uh, and Sintef uh, and uh, Chagask Brizhesh that is going also to talk about innovative technologies today. So we tried them for Haddock and Mackerel to see how they influence actually, how the high pressure influences uh, the, um, the quality of the fish minces. So we tried uh, 200 megapascal for five minutes and 300 megapascal for five minutes. And what we saw, yes, and we used this uh, high pressure processing uh, unit uh, in Dublin. So what we see that of course we have protein aggregation uh due due to uh, applied high pressure so, so the water both the water and salt soluble proteins fractions went down 
uh, compared to, to control, of course. And when we analyze the uh, microstructure of the, um, of the fish minces, uh, it was uh, more cleaved uh, after, after the application of high pressure. And uh, due to these, also we had changes uh, of color parameters. So the headache and mackerel uh, minces became more pale. Yes, and it was almost like they had been slightly cooked. Yes, but everything depends, of course, on uh, high pressure. So I found really interesting paper on effect of high pressure treatment on functional properties of proteins, why it's also very important for us. So depending on uh, high pressure level and cycle and temperature, also uh, chamber design, we can have bottom up and top down processes. So uh, what we can have at the end, of course, we have structural dissociation, subunit enfolding. Uh, we, we can have losses of uh, alpha helix uh, degradation of subunits, but at the same time, by, by having uh, all these changes in the, um, in the proteins, uh, we can increase some of the functional uh, properties, like uh, solubility can, uh, can go up, thermal properties can go up, um, emulsification, foaming, and some rheology. So by studying this, we can uh, increase also the functional properties of uh, our hydrolysates. Uh, and um, uh, the same in the same way, we have another uh, technique which is called um, pulse electric field uh, that also uh, creates small pores uh, in the product uh, by using the, um, the term you, uh, called permeabilization of the membrane. Membrane. So the food product is um, uh, inserted uh, into the special. Uh, um, um, special vessel with the water and the electric uh, field is created because it's the product is between two electrodes and under the um, electric field uh, we have formation of small pores in our cell membrane uh, and of course uh, different um, uh, reactions so for example um, we can have um, a degradation of, uh, of some uh, compounds, uh, release of, for example, lipid or, or, or protein, uh, proteins, uh, and um, degradation of enzymes and others. So we also tried with the University of Bologna uh, two years ago um, to try to see the influence of uh, PEF treatment on sea bus fillets. It was a salting experiment, uh, but anyway, since we analyzed the fish muscle subjected to PEF treatment, we saw the changes in the muscle and uh, the formation of uh, small pores in, in the fish muscle uh, led to changes also in functional properties of uh, proteins. Of course, led also to aggregation of some proteins, but it was uh, it led to more uptake of um, uh, salted brine and uh, better quality parameters. So these two technologies can be applied uh, to our um, to our to our hydrolysis. And this is actually one of the ideas that uh, is, is going to, to, be, to be applied soon. So uh, what if we take a rest of material, of course, uh, high quality, and first extract high quality fish oil by using advanced non-thermal technologies without using actually cooking as, as uh, for example, is used for tran, but by using high pressure or um, by using, for example, PEF or, or ultrasound uh, to actually preserve the, um, the quality of the fish oil. So it will be uh, obtained by non-thermal uh, non treatment and 
uh, and uh, pressurized pressurization yes and then from the mass that is uh, um, is obtained after this um, uh, oil extraction we can further extract and it will be second extraction of fish oil and proteins by classical enzymatic hydrolysis so by this we can increase the quality of the oil uh, that can be used for food consumption and to to have uh, fish oil and protein hydrolysis that can be used for fish meal or animal food they will have a bit um, uh, lower quality yes and what i want to uh, mention here that uh, i'm uh, open for any collaboration in this field with you if you have any ideas and now i'm collaborating with tiagask on this topic we are we have performed we have performed high pressure processing uh, and uh, on fish uh, fish means and uh, we perform also hydrolysis now we are uh, analyzing the the final products but i cannot show the results because it's still ongoing and this is the project of my phd student so uh, i will be glad to share results uh, when uh, we are going to publish them so thank you very much for your kind attention okay so uh, i'm waiting for the questions from the audience uh, anita do do you do you uh, do you have any question, questions from the audience? Yes, thank you, Jana. It was a really nice, comprehensive uh, presentation. I especially liked the, that you had a lot of pictures, making it a bit easier to understand because this is difficult. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have a question here from Rafael. Yes. Felix. Uh, he is wondering about the importance of optimization of downstream operations in making these added value ingredients available to the industry, such as drying of the hydrolyzed site. Mm -hmm. Is there innovation going on there? Um, actually, I didn't hear about um, uh, drying um, uh, of hydrolysis. No, if some of my colleagues have any ideas, uh, because I, I, we are not working on uh, downstream operations. And uh, now we are just trying to use these um, uh, innovative technologies to improve the yield and to see how this high pressure uh, affects the quality and also uh, affects the enzymatic activity. If we, for example, try to, to do this before uh, enzymatic hydrolysis. So uh, how it um, uh, actually reduce the, the, the activity of endogenous enzymes. This is um, how to say what we are working with. Uh, okay, have you done any process at industrial scale? Actually, actually, uh, Brijesh can, uh, can confirm that um, now that we are working with uh, is the uh, semi-industrial or industrial scale, actually. The unit that I showed is the unit that Bridges is using for our project. He is also a PhD student. So yes, it was the industrial, uh, industrial scale. So we obtained uh, seven kilos of treated material. And now we and we perform enzymatic acti enzymatic hydrolysis here at Antinu in in Olisund. and my PhD student is now analyzing. It's a huge work. It's a lot of samples. I cannot see how many. It's just oh, oh. we were freeze, freeze freeze drying the hydrolysis hydrolysis for oh, almost three weeks. You know, it was huge batches actually. So now we are, we started to analyze. Yes. Okay. And there's a question from Monica. Yes. Have you used only fresh pressed raw material or have you also tested silage as the raw material? No, we were working with fresh rest raw material directly from the slaktiri, uh, from the slaughtery house. Uh, it was last year with our students. Uh, and this year we tried uh, frozen uh, rest raw material. Uh, but it was of high quality because we took care of this. It was frozen at minus 80. 
and preserved all of its uh, initial quality. So, mm -hmm. but I never, we never uh, tried sealage because also, I'm, I'm telling this also to my PhD student, that we are most interested in high value compounds for uh, food consumption and okay, maybe for uh, the rest, maybe for animal, but we are more concentrated uh, on extraction of high uh, value compounds. This is our priority. Okay, next question is from a group Jergalat Norse. How will the non-thermal pretreatment step affect the enzyme treatment step? For example, could temperature be lowered and are the enzymes working sufficiently at lower temperature? Uh, yes, this is the good question, but uh, that is what we are going to investigate. If we increase the high pressure treatment, so usually we treat at um, 300, 300, 600, yes. So if we increase a bit uh, high pressure treatment uh, and or, or increase the duration of high pressure treatment and at the same time um, use uh, maybe um, uh, other advanced technologies, uh, maybe lower temperature, then we have a synergistic effect. So we can, uh, we can because usually when, when you, uh, when you, uh, obtain like tran, yes, or, or or extract fish oil by using higher temperatures, yes. So it's like to inactivate, uh, it should be uh, more than 70 degrees Celsius or, or 90, yes. Uh, so uh, if you increase the high pressure, it was also um, shown in some papers that you kill most, uh, most of uh, enzymes. Yes, of course, you degrade some uh, some proteins as well, which is not good. We will try to optimize. We will try. It's not, you know, straightforward. It's not simple. We are optimizing now. Therefore, we have a huge experiment uh, with Tiagask also. Uh, but we are uh, we are trying, and this is our idea, because if we if you can do this, then you don't need to to use high pressure or high, high temperature, sorry, and then you can preserve uh, the oil, which is important, or the proteins. The, the point here is the point here is that, for example, if, if we are most interested in the oil, that we don't care about the proteins, right? I mean, we do care, but we don't care for the high value products. So therefore, if we uh, increase the high pressure, so if we apply, for example, 800 megapascal or, or 900 megapascal for 10 minutes, yes, then we, uh, we preserve the oil, we preserve the oil, the, those uh, valuable omega-3, and yes, and we coagulate some, some proteins and kill some of the enzymatic activity. And then further, we can use this batch of, of, of the fish means after the first treatment for protein recovery. And then we don't need to have a thermal treatment before, but we need to investigate. We, we have already investigated some, but I, 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 cannot, I don't want to disclose the results because it's like partially results. We need to have the, the huge picture. But we did see, yes, we did see something. We did see that, uh, of course, the high pressure coagulates, aggregates the proteins. Of course, there, there is re reducing in, in, uh, in the yield. Uh, uh, but uh, we also saw some increase in, uh, in uh, the yield of water soluble proteins. So we will see, you know, we will see. Okay, you have more questions in general. Yes. Two more. Uh, this is from Giovanna. Yes. Uh, asking, is there already a commercial commercialization of products obtained from marine raw materials for human consumption? If yes, how? Um, yes. Um, the, actually, uh, there are many, uh, many products in the market from the, from the raw materials that you can see here. For example, also in Norway, sometimes I'm buying them, uh, the powders of uh, fish hydrolysate bioactive. Sometimes I'm buying also food collagen, fish collagen. It's, and in the package, it's written on the package that it was obtained from uh, from fish skin and it's like um, uh, cod skin 
Uh, also uh, in Norway, uh, yeah, and it was question, yes, how consumers are responding. Mm -hmm. Me as consumer, I'm responding positively, you know, because I, I really saw that uh, those powders are, are really effective. You know, for example, during winter time when you're tired, I, I feel more, how to say, more energy, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so it's this is in Norway. In other countries, I also saw. I saw some when I was uh, in Spain. Also, some some hydrolysis powder before COVID when we could travel, and also in Italy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have another question. Yes. Yes, um, you have one that's in the Q and A. It's from Brittilde Mottusbara asking how you consider these processing methods against the novel food legislation compliance ah yes this is very uh, good question so high pressure processing is allowed for use in the food industry and is largely used now in germany uh, in germany for uh, producing uh, raw uh, raw juices also uh, here in norway uh, i once i saw a bottle of uh, of fruit juice it was orange juice produced in uh, spain and uh, it was produced by high pressure so since it's already in the market it's allowed so high pressure is allowed and uh, it, it has been already used for 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 10 years now even more bridges can tell me more can tell us more about this and um, for PEF, uh, you need to ask today Silvia because she is more in the topic about uh, if it's allowed or not. But uh, cold plasma is not allowed yet. Cold plasma treated water is not allowed yet. And there are many debates, but we are not going, going to use cold plasma. So I'm mostly interested. Ultrasound is allowed. Ultrasound is used for uh, micro emulsions a lot and, uh, and uh, other kind of uh, creams uh, making processes. Yes, so uh, we are doing what is allowed. Okay. Um, next question. It's yes. from Samira. Thank you for such a beneficial info. Is there any possibility for fast fatty acids to negatively be affected under PEF or ultrasound? Is that the one you answered a bit? Uh, no, I didn't answer this. Uh, so uh, since I didn't display ultrasound, um, I don't want to specu speculate about this. We didn't try it yet. Uh, this is also our idea for further projects. So if some of you are interested to collaborate with us and to, to write a, a proposal for Horizon or other projects on the, on the influence of ultrasound on, on um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, yes, we are very interested. And also Sintef is very interested. I think really yes, is very interested. So, so just let me know and we will collaborate and we'll in, investigate it together. Mm. Okay, and then we have the last question is from Runar Solstad. Thank you for this comprehensive view on utilization of co-products. You say you concentrate on the protein fraction and the oil fraction, but do you see any potential using the sediment fraction after hydrolysis? Uh, for instance, unsolubilized proteins and other solids. Yes, uh, I had uh, uh, some ideas and I talked to my colleagues, uh, Signore from, from um, actually Mary Foshny, now he's our colleague, uh, to start using this for feeding some, um, how it's called, Schöpölse, this uh, kind of marine organisms. Uh, and we, we are going to try because I collected this fraction and he is going to try and to see in Atlantis Half Park how it's going. Uh, this was one of uh, my ideas and second idea yes is to to use in fish uh, feeding trials but for this we need to to have uh, like uh, possibility like sea lab to use so this is uh, um, for this we need to have um, a project a big project to have more resources but yes this was my ideas and also uh, to use as fertilizer as fertilizer mm -hmm. is also possible, but we are mostly interested in maybe as fish feed or feed for marine organisms. Okay, then we have no more questions and we are yes. just in time for the next, next speaker. Yes, so I need to announce the next speaker. So the next speaker will be Silvia Tapi from University of Bologna.
Thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much, Silva. It was really, really interesting presentation. I remember you also presented the, um, the similar topic on Weftel last. Yes. No, it was yes, last year. No, two years ago already. Yes. yes. Uh, I, I have a question to you. Uh, did you use homogeneous raw material, like homogeneous batch of crustaceous, or or it was uh, like a mix of different? Uh, now we use uh, uh, homogeneous batches. Uh, we're collaborating with a company uh, which is here near uh, the scene, it's just an article. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have, uh, they, they, they are a processing company. So they, uh, to valorize this fish, they, ex they extract the, the flesh and they sell it as, uh, they, they first they process it to sell it. And, uh, and so they provide us with uh, uh, the raw material and each time we use uh, the same batch. So the raw material, uh, more homogeneous as possible as you know it can be mm -hmm. but uh, yes it was homogeneous mm -hmm. but uh, where do they usually use those shells do they waste them or they made mostly yes, yes. okay they, so... they actually are they are a small company so but they are quite interested because they have a huge amount of waste mm -hmm. and they at the moment they don't do anything with it mm -hmm. which okay. is a big uh, big shame no, it's, it's very interesting. Anita, I just wonder, do we have some questions in the chat? Uh, yes, we have a question in the yes. Q&A. It's from Antonio uh, in North in Bergen. He is asking, uh, how important is the decoloration, the pigmentation step? Uh, he noticed it is mostly done by chemical treatment. Is there any biological alternative? And does ultrasound also help with this step? Thanks. So thanks for the question. So uh, the decoloration step uh, is not applied all the time. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's obtained by removing pigments with chemicals. There is, uh, to my knowledge, uh, no uh, enzymatic treatment to do the same. So I didn't find anything in the literature. I don't know if there is any enzyme that could do that. But at the moment, it's mainly uh, applied by chemical treatments. And it's important, it, it, it depends on the final application of the product. Uh, so what you want to obtain, uh, so in relation to the color um, is not a problem in relation to the functional properties, but it depends on what kind of application you want to obtain or how pure you want your components to be. So it's a process, uh, it's a step that can be omitted, but it depends on the, on the, what, what you, uh, the final properties of the final product that you expect to have. So if it's important, not the color, basically mm -hmm. but what is the color actually of your ketosan in the final it tends process? to be it tends to be light pink and orange mm -hmm. mainly depending on the accession team uh, the, the pigments that you can find in the carapace so they are extracted with uh, with ketin extraction but they can be removed so it, it depends on the on the application that you want to have these products whether it, mm -hmm. it's a problem or not or if you want to particularly pure uh, thinking about pharmaceutical applications, of course, mm. with a high level of purity. Yeah, so it, it, it means that you obtain ketosan along with the, some pigments like uh, like uh, astaxanthin or, or some other, right? Um, I, I'm not sure that the pigments are removed in that way are actually uh, possible to use. As also there is the proteinization step, but it's mm -hmm. use young, yeah, strong acids. Mm -hmm. So the actual components are degraded to an extent, so I'm not sure that uh, you can valorize this uh, this type of uh, of component extract in that way. I'm not sure about this. Mm -hmm. We have one more question in the in the chat. So Anita, you can read it. Uh, yes, it's from uh, Pion. Uh, he says, "Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Can you expand on why the application of ultrasound does not enhance the efficient efficient?" efficiency of uh, the mineral the mineral the mineralization step thanks for the question uh, actually uh, i'm not sure about this uh, in the sense that uh, um, it was only um, the, the, there are very few studies on this application uh, i found only two studies and uh, the only thing that they verified is it didn't affect this step uh, but uh, there isn't anything uh, else explaining this also in the papers. So I'm not sure. I don't really can answer. I don't, I don't want to speculate on something. 
So what was observed is that it allowed to improve the removal of protein, but not the minerals. But uh, this is all uh, that was um, uh, verified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There are no more questions uh, now. Yes, so uh, I thank you again, Silvia, for such an interesting presentation and for your agreement to take part in this webinar. Thank it's really much. added, it's really added, added value. So um, we, we discussed with, uh, with uh, Anita and others that uh, we are going to have short break, five minutes now. So, okay, everyone, we uh, have back, uh, we, uh, came back and uh, are going to continue our webinar. I hope five minutes were okay for you. Uh, so we are going to continue with uh, Professor Bridges Tiwari from Chagas University from Ireland, Dublin. Uh, he has uh, a huge, uh, huge uh, experience in uh, everything that is related to innovative technologies. So, Bridges, the floor is yours, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jenna, for organizing this wonderful uh, event. Uh, I do learn a lot of examples. So, uh, today I'm going to cover about uh, various technologies which can be used for extraction of compounds from fish raw material. And uh, one good thing happened in the morning sessions that a lot of things have been covered why we can use these type of uh, raw biomass. And I'm going to give overview of different technologies, how it can be used, putting example from other processing streams. So this is the place where I come from, Chagas, that's uh, <clears throat> Irish Agriculture and Food Development Authority. And uh, we have two centers related to food. One is in uh, Dublin, where I, am, where I am based. Another one is in Cork. So before going actually into the topic, I would like to just put a stress on uh, what is current status. If you look at current status, current agri-food chain, irrespective of the product, and uh, this is uh, <clears throat> the statistics over here are mainly from uh, journal science. So with, if you take any of our agri-food system, what we do get out of the system is both economic benefit and social benefits in terms of food as well as uh, nutrition. And uh, <clears throat> But what is happening is we are also emitting huge amount of uh, greenhouse gases. And these are the estimates from the journal, which has been quoted at the bottom. Apart from this, we are also emitting large amount of greenhouse gases, acidification and eutrophication. It's, uh, this is all owing because of food processing systems. And fish or seafood is not exception to this. So if we take all the food based stage, right? If you take all the food based globally and uh, it in terms of greenhouse gas emission, it can be considered as a third biggest country in the world after China, US and uh, <laughs> before India amount of countries which are emitting huge amount of greenhouse gases. So, uh, so before we develop any strategy, because why do we want to extract uh, valuable compounds out of fish. So we need to set the scene. Setting the scene in the sense why and how we are going to do it and what we would like to achieve. So if you look into our United Nations Sustainability Developmental Goal number 12, which talks about this is for almost um, all the food systems, they have calculated uh, uh, <clears throat> they have calculated both how many food losses, what type of food losses occurs at various levels all the way from harvesting different uh, processing chain and at food waste index that is at retail and consumption. So if we are able to reduce these type of waste, so we are not only helping environment, but we are also getting towards uh, zero waste approach. So zero waste approach, so basically means to make process more resource efficient and to be a more eco innovative. So if you look into EU's bioeconomy charter. We deal with two things within this particular uh, circle. One is using better what we already use and unlocking the potentials of seas and oceans. So using better what we already use, that means if you take any of the uh, um, seafood processing line, whether it's uh, frustrations, as uh, previously the speaker Sylvia was outlining how we can get 
chitin and chitosan by using new technologies from uh, byproduct or waste stream. And similar approach can go for insect processing. Similarly, to read also outline range of different byproducts uh, as well as uh, Jenna outline different types of byproducts which can be used with the different uh, attributes. So we really addressing one key point that is using better what we already use. And apart from that, unlocking the potential seas and ocean, especially fish crossing bycatches, because uh, you know there's new um, EU fisheries policy that you cannot dump unwanted fish back to sea is there is a landing obligation and there is a big challenge how do we address that and how do we get uh, valuable compounds out of it in order to do that we have two approaches one is biotransformation that is converting the converting waste or streams into valuable compounds or adding values to processing streams so if you look into any of the fish uh, fish processing line this is a very simple one and is very well described by our previous speakers. So I'm not going to spend much of time on it. So we have landing of fish. We do processing, whether it's fish fillet, canned fish, or fish meal or oil. And the range of different types of products which can be obtained out of uh, various, uh, various fish. And one of the key element is whole fish. That means uh, whole fish, how it can be transformed into value-added product or fish trims, that is obviously as an output of fish fillet and defilleting. And the most important element is the wastewater. How do we make use of wastewater to come up with a valuable ingredient? Or can we use it as a raw material? I'll quote some of those examples in coming slides. So if you, like, uh, if you look into transformational strategy, so why would you like to use new or innovative technology? whether it's high pressure, ultrasonics, pulse electric field, kytosan, oh sorry, uh, ultrasonic for kytosan application was already presented. Range of different technologies can be used. What they help in? They mainly help in improving shelf life and safety aspect. For example, one of the key issues with uh, extraction, at the moment we are talking about, we get um, 100 kg of byproduct, we freeze dry it or we freeze it, and then we carry out extraction. How do we scale it up? How best we can make sure because it's uh, suppose a company is producing uh, uh, a factory is producing a ton of waste every day. How it can be preserved? Either we use a new interventions to stabilize the raw material, which can be used for subsequent value addition. So in that case, these new technologies, whether it's uh, for uh, preservation strategies or for extraction, it improves shelf life and safety aspect of uh, raw biomass. When we use it as a pretreatment or an extraction approach, it improves enhanced recovery. Majority of new technologies, they have a very short treatment time. So they have a better in nutritional attributes compared to conventional, where we may have to go longer uh, <clears throat> extraction time. It adds value and helps in utilization of waste. So fish, one of the key ingredients, what we can get out of it is the protein. So, this type of transformational strategies can be for any type of uh, biomass, especially when it comes mainly for uh, protein. Either we go for dry extraction. So here, what you see unit is uh, combined ultrasonics and microwave. And this is the pilot scale unit, what we have, and we are going to use it with Jenna in uh, coming uh, <clears throat> months. Now, this is a pilot unit, and this can be scaled up to whatever scale we need it. Second one mentioned here is the supercritical fluid extraction that combines with ultrasonics. One of the key element of uh, supercritical fluid extraction is for extraction of oils. What if we introduce ultrasound along with supercritical fluid extraction and we have that fab unit fabricated with us in Chagas, where we introduce ultrasound when CO2 is in liquid state and it allows disruption of biomass and it improves extraction of fish oil. And then whatever leftover biomass can be used for protein extraction <clears throat> and other ultrasonics. I'm not going to go in details of it. Now here the approach is one on wet extraction where we use solvent or water as a clean solvent for extraction purposes or there's a dry extraction. That means if we have a <clears throat> biomass without adding any solvent, 
if you do give a microwave treatment along with ultrasonics or microwave alone or a PF treatment, it is easier to squeeze out the oil out of it because it ruptures the matrix. And then subsequently, we can carry out on other extraction streams. I mentioned a term called clean and green extraction, and we do see this type of terminology used exclusively for extraction with the new manuscripts which are coming in. We use ultrasound is a clean and green, microwave clean and green. So what is really clean and green? Basically, if you look into the principles of clean and green, this is, I uh, forgot to cite the paper over here. It's uh, basically has been outlined by Farin Chimat from, uh, uh, from France. So this particular principles of clean and green extraction technology is related to one, selection of it, varieties or use of renewable sources. So fish is a renewable sources, so I tick one of the boxes. Use of alternative solvents and principally water or agro solvent, that means which are allowed for, which are greener or which are clean for environment, not use methanol or corrosive chemicals, especially water, ethanol, these are good candidate for green solvents. Reducing energy consumption by energy recovery or using innovative technology. For example, if you use ultrasonics compared to conventional, we reduce the processing time. So we are conserving the energy. Third, production of co-product instead of waste. That means every fraction of the product is utilized. So if we are using a fish only for fish oil, then if you are able to extract uh, the compounds of the bone and, uh, and get a protein from flesh, that it will add uh, to a clean and green principle. Fifth principle outlines reduces the unit operation and fair safe and robust control processes. That means if you have one single step intervention that is possible in the case of fish, if we have ultrasonics or microwave together with enzyme, we can have enzyme followed by disruption of that inactivation of enzyme and fractionation by using a biorefinery approach. Aim for non-denatured and biodegradable extract without contaminants. That means we have to obtain extract which does not contain or is having uh, properties preserved without any contaminants. So having said the clean and green extraction techniques, we often have seen a lot of um, research work goes on pretreatment. And if you see pretreatment is on the most important step for extraction, but it's the least studied uh, stuff. So you take any biomass, either you pretreat or you don't pretreat it. Pretreatment can be again, you know, conventional methods like grinding, milling, or giving uh, acid treatment, uh, ethanol or formaldehyde for preservation purposes or for color, a number of different applications or new techniques, bead milling, extrusion, ultrasonic, microwave, supercritical, enzymatic hydrolysis, or without pretreatment. So pretreatment followed by extraction. Here again, novel extraction, conventional, that means what uh, we often use all the time. And one of the best thing is combination of novel and conventional or com combination of two novel technologies. For example, I mentioned about ultrasound and microwave enzymes and ultrasonics, microwave enzymes, ultrasound and supercritical, or using ultrasonics with conventional normal uh, solid liquid extraction. So these are some of the approaches how we can transform raw biomass into value added compounds. So within that, we have another uh, <clears throat> Another approach here is to use green solvent or non-green solvents. So basically green solvents, again, as I mentioned in the previous, uh, <clears throat> previous slide, it's uh, all those solvent which do not have negative impact on the environment. Non-greens are those which are corrosive and have negative imp impact on environment. Now, again, if you see the pretreatment strategies, so one of the key elements of pretreatment is disruption of biomass. So I'm not going to go in details of it. Basically, pretreatment, which is listed uh, in a previous slide, can be can dislodge various compounds into different uh, fractions and helps in subsequent processing and extraction. 
It's very similar how enzymes uh, and protease can break the network to release oils and other bioactive compounds, followed by different extraction technique, whether it's a physical, chemical, biological, or combination of these. So these are uh, techniques what can be used for pretreatment of biomass. And uh, after this, when we have pretreatment done, we have a number of different technologies which can be used. Again, classical and novel extraction or combination of these to arrive at clean and green extraction system. Now, this, these are some of the technologies what we are working and which are currently in our lab. We already seen the ultrasonic description I mentioned about supercritical fluid extraction. The machine where you see in a corner is the supercritical fluid extraction along with the ultrasonic placed in it, this part. Over here is microwave plus ultrasound state extraction. This is the machine what we designed over in Chagas and this is what we have purchased commercially. Now, one of the advances here is using hydrodynamic cavitation. Now, this hydrodynamic cavitation, as you can see from this particular sample, a straw can be converted into the slurry. So how hydrodynamic cavitation can be used because there are some limitations where ultrasonics can be scaled up to a large scale. So the system what we have, uh, <clears throat> what we have for hydrodynamic cavitation is a system which can run at 200 liter an hour capacity. And it is basically a cavitating pump. It produces cavitation very similar to ultrasonic cavitation and disrupt the matrices and thus makes process continuous for extraction. So once we are able to disrupt a matrix and increase the particle size, like particle surface area, by decreasing the particle size, we are able to do subsequent extraction very easily. So we have been using this hydrodynamic cavitation for seaweeds as well as for uh, some other uh, solid biomass. And it works very effective. And most of the application in biological engineering you'll see in uh, anaerobic digestion or disruption of biomass for subsequent fermentation. Now I'll quote one simple example about fish processing side stream. For example, if you see whole fish washed fillet and we get protein rich food or fish, maybe sardines or tuna, they're brined, canned and we get protein rich food. So these are the couple of byproducts what we obtain. When we have a brine or wastewater, we can have up to five to 10% protein in brine solution or washing of fillet can have a protein up to 3% depending upon the type of filleting. And this amount of water is huge. So what type of technology can be used and how we can green this particular process towards zero waste is either to go for membrane and produce protein rich powder, which is obviously water soluble, uh, uh, <clears throat> mainly water soluble proteins, either through its fair drying or freeze drying. Or this particular uh, washed water is concentrated and we can obtain via, uh, by using evaporator to spray dry or freeze dry to obtain protein. And you might be thinking this is very low amount of protein, but we should not forget there is also a whey protein, which is only 0.51 or 2% in dairy, and still it is used for whey protein concentrate. Now, the advantage of using membrane is this particular water can be reused within the process line. So even if you, sorry, even if you look into uh, different ultra filtration, it shows how much protein and we can obtain by using different brine. Now, here still one advantage is whatever wastewater we get of washing the fish when it is harvested. Normally in some of the industry, because at least uh, I've seen this in, uh, in, in Ireland, where fillet washed water, so that's called pin water or processed water is mixed with the wastewater for, for water treatment. And if we are able to retrieve protein, we are able to reduce COD and BOD before and reduces the time required for or reduce the wastage of water. In just in an estimate for 100 kg of sardine, nearly 11 kg of protein and 4 kg of uh, lipids are uh, fatty acids are lost with water around 23.5 cubic meter. So this is a, just an estimate coming out of a processing. So this shows how much amount of product we are throwing back. Now, coming back to this wastewater, 
This is the work which has been uh, done for a couple of uh, wastewater treatment from dairy effluent to produce duckweed and production of duckweed followed by recovery as a protein powder and then reduces environmental, uh, reduces water treatment cost of plants. And this duck, particular duckweed is a good source of protein which can be used for animal feed purposes. So I'll quote some of the examples of biorefinery from marine seaweed site. I know this is not the topic of discussion here, but this just demonstrate how we have used uh, for aquaculture seaweed, to have efficient drying systems by calculating how we can reduce energy and obtain different fractions through hydrodynamic cavitation for getting value added compounds. Similarly, for uh, similarly for biorefinery of wild harvest seaweed, previous one was aquaculture seaweed, and how we can obtain almost all the different fractions. I'll quote one simple example. When we used uh, ultrasonics alone, whatever yield we had with microwave, there was a nine-fold increase. When we combine both ultrasonic and microwave, we have almost 18-fold increase and two-fold increase. And the same approach of ultrasound and microwave together, we are going to explore when uh, with Jenna on uh, on uh, biomass, on uh, raw fish biomass. And now coming back to the challenge of using these technologies, the majority of the technologies what are used are at basic research level, which is obviously a comfort zone of most of the researcher. The bigger challenge is how do we translate these technologies for commercial applications to advance the TRL level? One thing is their technologies are there and how do we develop a process? It's not the technology which will be developed into a process. Technologies are known and we just have to focus on developing a process. To conclude, complete valorization of fish processing stream is challenging, though achievable towards zero waste approach. And what is required is transformation and translational approaches. There are technologies available, but one single technology cannot solve uh, complete valorization of uh, biomass or obtain all the products. However, adoption of circular economy and bio principle, uh, biorefinery will be the key in order to valorize range of different products and get stream um, a range of value added products from seafood. Although most of the examples quoted here um, are from other streams, but similar approaches applies to fish. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Bridges, for such an interesting uh, overview, also very useful for me. Uh, I just wonder, what, what, what is your opinion? What is the most effective innovative technology nowadays that can be applied for fish industry? I mean, to extract the uh, uh, valuable compounds. What is your, your own opinion? Oh, sorry, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, sorry? yes, yes. Uh, what is the most um, effective uh, innovative technology that can be applied now for fish industry? Well, see, most effective technology can yes. be, it's just uh, largely what type of product we are, we are going to target. And uh, it's actually, if you see the whole stream, like even if you're stabilizing the raw material for high pressure, which obviously you mentioned an example, we can hit two things. One is stabilization of the product, that means removing the microbial load and also rupturing the matrix, which can help in subsequent extraction of the process. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to normal extraction, I see cavitation technology, both ultrasonics as well as uh, hydrodynamic cavitation can play a vital role in disrupting these matrices. And it, these can be now scaled up easily. Okay. But uh, do you have um, like pilot plant ultrasound at your facilities? Yeah, we have uh, we have nearly about uh, 14 different ultrasonic systems operating all the way from 20 kilohertz frequency to one megahertz, that is 1000 kilohertz. And the most effective frequencies for extraction of removal of oil comes from 400 and 600 kilohertz. And these are the flat plates which can be attached to any of those reactors where we want to achieve these type of extractions. Okay. And one advantage of using ultrasonics is we can achieve, if it's, it's a slurry of biomass, 
we can give a pretreatment without adding any solvent for recovery of uh, at least oil from the waste. Yeah, it could be indeed used as pretreatment for hydrolysis, <laughs> as, as at least I see this uh, uh, potential. Okay, uh, do we have any questions, Anita, from the chat? No, not yet, at least. Yeah, so yeah. actually, I think we can continue with the next speaker because we are um, short of time due to the short break. And if there are some questions, we will cover them at the end of the webinar. So the next um, speaker will be Revilia Mozuratiti from Sintef. I hope I pronounce your, your surname correctly, uh, Revilia. Uh, so uh, Revilia is a senior researcher at Sintef, uh, having a huge experience with uh, fish processing, analysis, extraction of uh, valuable compounds and um, uh, particularly oils, fish oils, and stabilization of fish oils. So Rivilla will tell us more in detail about your research related to this topic. Yes, Rivilla, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this nice introduction. So I will try to share my presentation and uh, I hope you can see it. So first of all, thank you for organizers for giving me this opportunity to present some data on the processing and stabilization of marine raw materials with antioxidants. And as Shana mentioned, I am from a Research Institute Center of Ocean and Marine Ingredient Technology Group. And in our group, we develop and optimize technological solutions for 100 utilization of harvested and cultivated different marine resources. So as you can see some examples in the picture. But in this presentation, I will focus more on the rest uh, raw materials obtained after fish processing. So when we think about the fish, we know that only 40, 60% makes up the fillet that is going directly to human consumption. And the rest is heads, viscera, backbones, uh, cutoffs, and skins that are not used directly for human consumption. And, it big, uh, and it, they make quite big volume of the, of the whole fish. Also from the presentation of Kuri Drustev, we already remember probably that in 2018, it was generated lots of restaurant materials in Norway, more than 900,000 tons. And from approximately composition of those restroom materials, we know that this huge amount of the restroom materials contains also huge amounts of lipids that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, also proteins. And these huge amounts of lipids and proteins actually is enough to cover, as you see on the screen, several million people daily recommended the intake of proteins and lipids. And in Norway, actually, quite big amount of those generated rest raw materials, they are utilized. Uh, but they are utilized mostly for feed uh, application or other um, purposes. Also, you remember, Turi discussed a little bit the, where we use those rest raw materials for today. Oh, it's going a little bit fast. But even though, because those rest raw materials, they are very good quality, usually they are food grade quality after filleting the fish. So we still believe that high amount of this rest raw material can be used directly for, for human consumption. Not directly, but they can, use to, they can be used to process to marine ingredients that can be used for human consumption. So my short outline of the presentation. So today I want to discuss technological solutions that can be used to process those rest raw materials. And as uh, Jana mentioned, actually my focus area usually it's lipids, lipids oxidation, stabilization against oxidation using antioxidants. So in my presentation, I will focus on the yield of the oil using those different technological solutions, also on the quality of the oil. Also, I want to discuss with you very shortly oxidative stability of lipids, and I want to present the model system that we have at Sintef to screen effects of different antioxidants. And I will discuss very shortly antioxidant ability to protect lipids during processing and the final product. 
So the technological solutions that are used uh, for processing of the rest raw materials for today in industrial scale are mainly those three. So we can use this thermal processing of the rest raw material, especially this technology is applied when you have this happy rest raw materials. And if your main product or the focus product is the oil. Also, we had already presentations that enzymatic hydrolysis uh, is a technological solution that can be used to process the rest raw materials. We know that the principle of this technology is that you uh, mix uh, the rest raw materials with the water and the proteolytic enzymes and those enzymes they break proteins in the biomass and also if you have uh, um, quite high amount of the oil so this oil is also released and as uh, we already heard after this enzymatic hydrolysis is finished you have to inactivate those enzymes and traditionally for today is used that you heat the biomass Till approximately 90 Celsius centigrade for some time, and you inactivate the enzymes and you fractionate. And usually, the main products are protein hydrolysis and the oil. Also, uh, uh, silage is used as a technological solution to process rest raw materials. And the principle of this technological solution is that you mix uh, the rest raw materials with the acids to, uh, to, to increase microbiological stability of the rest raw materials. And actually this technology usually is used to process the rest raw materials if you cannot process them at once, if you have to store them for some time. So this process is a little bit more rough. So usually you get a slightly lower quality final products. And usually this technology is used for the production of ingredients for the feed. And as I said, in my presentation for today, I want to focus on the technological solutions that can be used to process rest raw materials uh, into marine ingredients that can be used for human consumption. Even that we work actually, and we have several projects on the silage optimization. So uh, at CENTEF, actually, it was done several PhDs on enzymatic hydrolysis of the rest raw materials. So for me, it came with this simple figure. I, actually, it was a little bit rude, but even though I will take this chance. So when we try to use enzymatic hydrolysis and thermal extraction on the salmon skin, salmon backbones, and mackerel rest raw materials, so you see that the oil yield was obtained slightly higher when we used enzymatic hydrolysis. But what about the quality of the oil? So if we take a look at the peroxide and anisidine value of the oils that was obtained from different rest raw materials using hydrolysis or thermal extraction, so you can see that slightly higher peroxide value and anisidine value you measure in the oil that is extracted using the hydrolysis process. And this is explainable because the hydrolysis process takes a little bit longer time. You run the hydrolysis for one hour, you add it, um, you mix the biomass and some oxygen can be incorporated and, uh, and therefore the oils can be oxidized. So then it comes the question, so can we protect uh, lipids against oxidation during this processing? Can we add something that would protect them? And in order to answer this question, first of all, we have very briefly to discuss so how this lipid oxidation is going. And uh, we know that fatty acids, they cannot, they cannot react with atmospheric oxygen. But they start to react if you have some prooxidants like metals, heat light, uh, that activate the fatty acids into fatty acid radical form. And then those radicals, they can interact with atmospheric oxygen and primary oxidation products like lipid peroxide are formed. Or lipid oxidation starts if you have another type of prooxidants that activate this atmospheric oxygen into activated singlet oxygen form. So then this oxygen can interact directly with fatty acids and again, primary oxidation products are formed, which lately are broken down to the secondary oxidation products. And those low molecular weight, volatile secondary oxidation products leads to this 
bad flavor and taste development. So we want to, uh, to, to stop the oxidation. So we see that the most important are prooxidants. So they catalyze the oxidation. So we have to inactivate them. But uh, sometimes it's not, it, it is not possible to take them from this, the system. You have them. So then we have to find if we can add some antioxidants that would stop those prooxidants to work or they can stop some, um, so those activated forms uh, to, 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 to catalyze the oxidation. So we can add antioxidants that, for example, chelates the metal, and then we stop the oxidation. Also, we can add antioxidants that are uh, such called radical scavengers. So they would bind those fatty acid radicals and then activate them. So this auto catalyzed oxidation will not occur or it will be stopped. Or we can add some antioxidants that would inactivate this activated singlet oxygen. So in order to find which antioxidant can help to reduce the oxidation in the rest raw material during processing, so we have definitely to screen different antioxidants and see which one can help to reduce us oxidation. And in order to screen different antioxidants, so definitely we have to have some kind of modal system that would enable us to screen the antioxidant activity in a very short time, because time costs money, yes? So I think that we developed the, the model system to study oxidation, and the principle of this model system is following. We know that fatty acids, they react with oxygen and lipid peroxides, primary oxidation products are formed. And lately they are broken down or can be broken down to several different secondary oxidation products. So if you want to quantify the oxidation, it's very difficult to rely on the measurement of one or two oxidation products. So then we chose um, uh, to, uh, to quantify the oxygen uptake rate uh, because oxygen is an oxidation substrate and we use this method to quantify the oxidation. So, and we do this this oxygen uptake measurements using this uh, polarographic oxygen electrode. So the principle is that, okay, you have those restroom materials, you mix them, you add a little bit water because you want to have this um, uh, yeah, not too viscous solution and you measure the dissolved oxygen concentration changes. So you get more or less like this curve. So the oxygen concentration is going a little bit down because your oils are oxidized and then you add an ingredient that you are interested in. So if you see that the salt oxygen concentration started to decrease very fast, so actually means that your ingredient works as prooxidant. So better don't add them to the, those rest raw materials because they will increase the oxidation. But if you add an ingredient that will reduce this the salt oxygen concentration changes, that it will slow down this oxygen consumption. So that means that this ingredient works as antioxidant. And you can add different those antioxidants and um, calculate the inhibition effect. So we use this model system to study oxidation in the mackerel restro materials. We use different uh, mackerel restro materials, so viscera, unsorted, or heads, bones, and tails. Because also we, we saw that the, the oxidation occurs and also Turid mentioned that, the, for example, viscera is very prone to oxidation. You have lots of oxidants in the viscera. So we added different antioxidants. You see in the table, it's quite busy, but what we saw that those synthetic radical scavengers like BHA, BHT, propylgalate, they were very effective to inhibit oxidation. Natural antioxidants like tocopherols, rosemary extract, they were also uh, inhibiting oxidation, but not so effective as radical scavengers, synthetic radical scavengers. And metal chelators like citric acid and ETTA, so they reduced very slightly oxidation in the rest raw materials. And this is explainable because probably iron was not the most important pro pro oxidant when you have those rest raw materials, probably the hemoglobin was more important because you have blood also in those rest raw materials. So this is the model system. So then we took those rest raw materials 
We mix them with different antioxidants, and then we use thermal extraction or enzymatic hydrolysis uh, using alkalase as enzyme. And you see that the slightly uh, higher oil yield was obtained when we used hydrolysis process. And antioxidants actually, they, they didn't have big effect or significant effect or clear effect on the oil yield. So hydrolysis gave slightly higher uh, um, oil yield. So what about the quality? Again, it's a little bit busy slide, but I will try to, to, to guide you. So control samples when we added no antioxidants, so then slightly higher peroxide value and anisidine value and totox was measured in the oil that was obtained by enzymatic hydrolysis. And uh, the oil that was uh, extracted from the rest raw materials mixed with those synthetic radical scavengers like BHA, propylgalate, actually those oils, you can see they had slightly lower PV and anisidine value. So that means that those synthetic antioxidants actually they helped to protect lipids against oxidation during the extraction. But the one thing is the oil quality after you extract the oil, yes? So how stable this oil would be? And there is another method that you can use to, um, to, to study the oil stability. It's called oxidative stability index. And the principle of this method is that you uh, measure conductivity changes while you store the oils at elevated temperatures. And when this conductivity starts to increase, so that means the oil is oxidizing. And we see here in this uh, screen that uh, if the oil that was extracted from the rest of materials that were mixed with no antioxidants, so it was the least stable. So this conductivity starts to increase the, the fastest. After that, it comes the oil that was extracted uh, from the rest of materials mixed with B, uh, propylgalate. And the most stable actually oil was the one that was extracted from the rest of materials mixed with tocopherols. So what I wanted to say here that you remember the quality of the oil was best when you use propylgalate to protect lipids against oxidation during processing. But the most stable oil that, you know, that as a final product actually was the one that was extracted from the rest of materials mixed with tocopherols. And why it is like this? Because tocopherol is more lipophilic antioxidant, so it went into the oil during extraction. So why you have this antioxidant in the final product and why it helps you to protect uh, this extracted oil against oxidation uh, during storage. Also, we studied, uh, we used the same model system to screen different antioxidants in the herring restaurant material. And we obtained very similar results that synthetic radical scavengers, they were very effective to reduce the oxidation in the restaurant material uh, from herring. Also, chelators, metal chelators were not very effective to reduce the oxidation. And also, we tested in this study caffeic acid. And from our previous, previous study, we, we know that caffeic acid works as antioxidant if you have hemoglobin as a prooxidant in the system. And it can work even as a prooxidant if you have iron in the system as the main prooxidant. So it really proved that hemoglobin is the most important prooxidant uh, um, and the uh, catalysator of the oxidation in the rest of materials. So the results that I presented till now actually they were based on the um, processing in the lab scale. But also at Syntef we have a mobile uh, production plant that can be used to, to, to extract fish oils and proteins. And it's really mobile because this uh, processing plant is in container and it can be shipped to the wanted location. And also in this uh, processing plant, you can modify various processes. So uh, this mobile processing plant was shipped to the herring fillet filleting factory because we wanted to test again how different those processing technologies can influence the quality of the oil extracted from the herring restaurant materials. And also if antioxidant, addition of the antioxidant can help to reduce 
the oxidation during processing. And this was done in semi-industrial scale. So we see that, uh, yes, we, we tested thermal extraction or thermal processing of the herring restaurant materials. So you can see the, the technological scheme of the process. And also we used enzymatic hydrolysis. And you see that the, the volume, so the, the um, yeah, that we was used in the in this experiment was really semi-industrial scale, so it's in hundred kilo scale. So, what about the quality of the oil that we obtained from this uh, uh, processing herring uh, restaurant material? So you see uh, that that uh, when we use this thermal processing to extract the oil. The lowest peroxide and anisidin value was obtained in the oil that was extracted from the raw material that was mixed with propyl gallate as antioxidant. So again, propyl gallate actually uh, in, uh, yeah, protected lipids against oxidation during this processing. Uh, and uh, also BHT was quite effective antioxidant and reduced uh, uh, this uh, formation of peroxides and aldehydes in the oil also during thermal and the enzymatic hydrolysis. And when we studied the stability of the extracted oil, again, we obtained the same tendency that more lipophilic antioxidant, like in this case, PHT, gave the oil that had the highest stability. So it really means that, you know, if you want to protect, uh, that the oil will be protected after the extraction. So we have to add some lipophilic antioxidant uh, early in the process. Yeah, so as I said, we, we studied a lot to the uh, processing of the restaurant materials. And when we studied this thermal extraction um, at different restaurant materials like salmon, skin, backbone, swissera, we obtained that actually increase of this thermal, of the, of the temperature during the thermal extraction actually did not increase so much the, the yield of the oil. So that means that you, know, you, you get more or less very similar the yield of the oil if you apply 40 Celsius centigrade or 90 Celsius centigrade. And for oil oxidation, definitely you want to use as low temperature as it's possible to get better quality oil, not to oxidize it. So then we proposed a two stage thermoenzymatic process that could be applied on, uh, on, yeah, in the processing of the restaurant material. So the principle of this process is that first we can use this mild heating, approximately 40 Celsius centigrade, to separate the premium quality oil. And also 40 Celsius centigrade is not so high temperature that you will denaturate the proteins. So then the rest of this biomass can go to enzymatic uh, processing. So you can add enzymes and run on the rest enzymatic processing, and then you would get secondary oil and also protein hydrolysis because they are now a little bit on fashion. So what about yields? So we see that when we tested this two-stage thermoenzymatic processing, if you sum the oil that was obtained during uh, using this mild thermal treatment and uh, this enzymatic uh, hydrolysis of the rest, the sum of the oil obtained in this thermal and the en en enzymatic treatment actually the higher was the higher this oil yield compared if you use only single thermal or single enzymatic hydrolysis. Also, we tested this two-stage uh, uh, thermoenzymatic process on the processing of the restaurant material from mackerel. Actually, in this study also, we added antioxidants, but we obtained the same tendency that the sum of the oil extracted with this mild thermal treatment and enzymatic give higher oil yield compared to those uh, traditional single uh, processing, thermal, thermal or enzymatic. So how about the quality of the oil? Because we are very uh, uh, keen on this. So uh, we see uh, that for thermal treatment, if you use salmon as, uh, as the raw material, because salmon oil usually it's a little bit more stable compared to, to the mackerel, for example. So you see that for thermal extracted oil, the 
the oxidative quality was similar if you use this thermal treatment using 90 Celsius centigrade or 40 Celsius centigrade. When you use enzymatic hydrolysis, again, you get a little bit higher uh, oxidation products in the oil, but it was not big difference if you use at once enzymatic processes or if you use this enzymatic process after this mild thermal treatment. So that means that for salmon, we didn't uh, uh, oxidize this oil a lot, you know, yeah, using this uh, two-stage thermal enzymatic processes. With the mackerel, it was a little bit different. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit complicated to explain everything, but I will try to do my best. So first we go to this thermal extraction. So then you will see, it was very interesting that we obtained lower PV value in the oil that was extracted with 90 Celsius centigrade compared to the oil that was obtained with uh, 40 Celsius centigrade. But also at the same time, we obtained higher anisidin value in the oil that was extracted using this 90 Celsius centigrade temperature. So that means when we use this higher temperature to extract the oil, some of the peroxides, they were broken down actually. So why you have in this oil more secondary oxidation products? So we can see that actually this thermal extraction gave us less oxidized oil. So they had those primary oxidation products, but they, had, they contain less secondary oxidation products. When we go to this enzymatic treatment part, so we see that slightly higher amount of peroxides and anisidin value we obtained in the oil that was, uh, uh, that was processed using this enzymatic processing after thermal extraction of the oil. So it was a little bit more oxidized oil. We obtained slightly higher PV and anisidin value. So can antioxidants help to reduce the oxidation in, uh, when we process this uh, mackerel restro materials using this two-stage thermoenzymatic processing? So we see that in this uh, thermal processing part, the antioxidants, they were not uh, very effective to reduce the oxidation. So the processing temperature actually was the more important. And this can be understandable because thermal processing, it takes minutes, you know, so it's quite short time. But when we go to this enzymatic processing part, which takes one hour, it's a little bit longer process. So then we see that the, uh, the antioxidants, they help to reduce the oxidation, both when we use only the enzymatic processing and also when we use this uh, enzymatic processing after this thermal uh, removal of the oil first. So, yeah, so for enzymatic processing, uh, antioxidants, they are really very important. Also, they reduce the secondary oxidation. So summing my, up my presentation, I, I want to say that the slightly higher oil yield might be obtained by enzymatic hydrolysis. But also we see that during the enzymatic hydrolysis also we can obtain a slightly higher oxidized oil if we compare with the thermal processing. So we have to take care. Also, I wanted to show that we have model system that we can use uh, to screen uh, oxidation and also effect of antioxidants. Also, addition of the right antioxidant can help to con control oxidation during processing, but also we have not to forget we need the right antioxidant to protect the, the oil against oxidation during the final storage. And the thermoenzymatic process, this two-stage uh, process can lead to the higher oil yield in total and better quality oil. So the data that I presented today in this presentation is generated in, 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 in several projects that I wanted to, to mention today, where Sindaf took part in. And also definitely I have to thank the co-authors of this presentation who helped and who took part into the producing the data that I presented today. And definitely thank you for all you listening to me. And probably now time for questions. Yes, Rivila, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the presentation. So I, I saw there are some questions in the chat. So Anita, could you please go through them? Yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, first, this is from uh, Monica. Um, she says, uh, this is for you, Revilla. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. How would you comment the fact that PG is protecting oil during processing, however, does not give an optimistic OSI score? Could it be explained that it is mostly separated in the protein phase and it is found in small amounts in oil after separation? Yes, exactly. So uh, thank you, Monica, you already answered the question. <laughs> yes, definitely, because also we we measured the antioxidant amount in the final oil. You know, we have only 20 minutes, so we cannot present all the data. And you see that actually not so much this propyl galate goes into the oil. So it goes uh, most probably into this water phase or those sediments. So, so therefore, you have to add some antioxidant that will end um, into the oil if you want to protect it in the final product. But during processing, yes, it helps. So we got better quality oil after you know extract you extract the oil because it means that this propyl galate works in this emulsion, this oil water system. So it works good. But when you separate the oil, so it went to this water system and you don't have it. Okay, next question is from Runar Solstad. Uh, he says, thank you for this interesting new approach. Have you performed any calculations on the increase of process costs of this new process since you would need an added separation step followed by a reintroduction of the RRM into the reactor tank? This is compared to traditional enzymatic hydrolysis. And he says he's thinking of the commercial potential of this process. Yes, actually, very nice question because we published, you know, because this two stage processing um, was developed in AU projects where we had also partners that did this economical calculation. So actually, we have a publication on this. I am not myself expert, you know, in the money <laughs> and how much investments you need, but actually they, they did calculations and that actually the conclusion was that it's it's economical profitable process so if you are interested we can just share you know this publication that it's uh, published and we are also co-authors of them so it's uh, yes it's it's done but definitely based on the on the lab scale uh, processing and the yields and everything so but even though it's it's done some rough calculation mm. Yeah, he says he will be happy if you share the uh, publication. Yeah, so if you can contact me, you know, uh, yeah, so definitely we will send you. Yeah, yeah. and then there's no more questions uh, yet. Just... Yeah, but uh, okay, should we go to the um, question sections to all of the participants? And uh, because I saw the, there was a question to, to Bridges before before the presentation of uh, of Rivila. and then we can uh, sum up because we are according to the schedule so and now it's time for summing up and questions to all the speakers so uh, could you please take that question uh, uh, Anita? Yeah, i think i saw it i think it was more a comment to bridges bridges uh, okay. how the final price of obtained ingredients will be influenced by applying advanced technologies for pre-processing of fish coast streams, then it is be applied industrially. So I don't know if it's a question or more a comment. Um, and I, read this, uh, I understand. I think if I'm getting the question correct, it's just if you do apply new technologies uh, across the valorization, is it more economical compared to what is already being done? Yeah, it's actually if... Uh, First question is, yes, it is economical based on the research studies and some of the calculations what we have already carried out, number one. And there are limited studies on sustainability of these approaches. Only few studies were done. And, uh, <clears throat> and as Sylvia mentioned, the sustainability evaluation has to be carried out for all of these techniques and to incorporate life cycle assessment from all the way farm to fork. Because the advantages what we get with the technology is the product quality. Second one is stability, what we can get and getting the extraction at shorter time compared to longer so that we have better stability of products. So it has to be seen in total. Okay, thank you, Bridges, for a nice explanation. I think nowadays it's um, 
like um, also a challenge to find the balance between the uh, economical profits out of the new technologies and then the traditional use because if we are coming with new solutions to the industry yes we also need to take into account the economical uh, profits and uh, actually the profits yes and uh, this should be also investigated yes we are coming with better products we are coming with better yields but uh, for the investments to for the industry to start investing into the new technology they need to see the real how to say perspective the real perspective so um, I, I want to to hear from all the speakers today what they think about finding a balance between new technologies that uh, could be um, used and should uh, should uh, have uh, how to say um, should should have a horizon for for the investment or should we stick to to the classical ones and just improve the technological um improvements like to use maybe maybe to find new enzymes or to to play with the temperature or should we go forward towards uh, new horizons towards new te te technologies so what do you think about this so we can start with you yeah bridges since yeah, you're on the screen <laughs> It's actually one of the one of the key question. What I think need to be answered is technology is there and it should be need based. You know, for example, if we do have a technology, that does not mean when we can get it done by, for example, uh, we don't have need to use ultrasound to crush it when we can achieve the same thing by using normal homogenizer, right? So yes. even in you can see, it was very interesting approach in chitosan extraction. Mm -hmm. the ultrasound can be used at a specific stage especially when you do demineralization and then its matrix becomes soft and we can employ hydrodynamic cavitator to improve the process to break down that matrix you know so it has to be used based on uh, that sorry technology should be need based number one and in order to do that we have to understand the physical chemical mechanisms and processes and how the technology works and where it can be used where it should not be used then it makes things much easier yeah but still i think it's a challenge for the industry to start investing into the new technologies we really need to to come with the like uh, amazing results yes to to start negotiating or, or proposing it's actually high pressure when you were quoting example of chaga uh, in ireland high pressure is one of the best example hpp tolling it's an industrial scale unit 200 liter an hour capacity and they do charge on a tolling basis so that type of arrangement has to be between public private partnership and then things makes easier you know because every company cannot uh, invest in getting such a high expensive equipment which needs a technical expertise as well yeah thank you also i would like to cover some questions related to stability and maybe rivile can help me so uh, you know you mentioned that um, okay at Sintef you were adding antioxidants right and i really like your be the beginning of your presentation when you showed that okay free fatty acids okay fatty acids that can they cannot um, react with the oxygen directly right so we need to have uh, um, fatty acid radicals so and then you propose to use antioxidant at the beginning so but how do you think because actually uh, several weeks ago we tried uh, also a new technology and got really good results uh, what if we uh, replace oxygen by nitrogen in the bioreactor you know and then we don't and then we should just reduce the amount of antioxidants and uh, and have uh, and, and don't have a, a lot of oxygen in the town of course you cannot uh, you cannot replace completely so but we tried to introduce nitrogen directly into bioreactor tank and uh, two weeks ago i analyzed peroxide value and it was really huge difference you know mm. so what do you think about that yeah, yeah definitely to yeah to, to to reduce this oxygen or to remove the oxygen it's very good because you remove you don't have this oxidation substrate so yeah no oxidation will occur okay if you run this enzymatic hydrolysis you will add the water so in water definitely you will have some soluble oxygen exactly. so you you will get a little bit yes. oxidation but definitely you have to try everything to reduce it but sometimes maybe 
Again, in the lab, you know, we can get this nitrogen very easy, you know, if you run this industrial scale. So maybe you are, uh, yeah, you don't have at the moment this nitrogen, you know, you have to improve your production plant, you know, with, uh, in introducing the nitrogen. So then you have a possibility to add some antioxidants. So yeah, it, it's kind of to show that, okay, we have possibilities, but definitely you have to evaluate, do you need those? To, to, to add those antioxidants, or you have to try, you know, to have those anoxic uh, uh, yeah, environment, and then you will stop the oxidation. But uh, yeah, and also, you know, this model system, you can you can study different uh, different um, oxidation environments. For example, also we can study the oxidation in the silage process. You know, and in the silage probe, I don't know, but we mostly probably they don't add this nitrogen. So then again, you can you can test how those different antioxidants can reduce the oxidation. Yeah. But again, you know, if we go to this previous your question, you know, about those new technological solutions. So I still believe that we have to investigate, you know, what they can give. And definitely we have to start in the lab skill, because if you don't get something promising in the lab so then you don't need to go to industrial scale yes <laughs> definitely but the, but also it's very interesting to to try this to upscale and the, you know why at center we have this uh, i was to say exclusive situation that we can study those processing in the lab scale but also we have those pilot process processing plants where we can try to upscale and see you know if our promising result in the lab can be obtained in the in the semi-industrial scale. And after that, you will go to, to industrial scale and probably can find some new challenges. But even though it's, we have to start from the lab, you know, because, uh, yeah. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much. I, I completely agree with you. And therefore, uh, we are trying here in Olisun uh, in lab scale. Also, of course, with the help of, um, of international universities, since we don't have innovative technologies uh, at NTNU yet, but we hope. So uh, I hope um, uh, everyone uh, uh, agrees with me that we need to invest into study and then in invest into the innovative technologies. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for more discussions today. It was really, how to say, intensive day. And uh, I thank uh, again all the speakers for very, very interesting presentations. So we need to wrap up now. And uh, I think uh, now I, uh, I we should invite Venke for the last uh, word. Yes, so please, Venke. Thank you so much, Jana, and thank you to all panelists and everybody who has been attending. This was great, and I really appreciate the work uh, done now by Antenu helping us with the organizing this event for the three clusters. Um, that were introduced in the beginning. So I, I would just thank you. And I would just add, uh, just put also in our chat, uh, there will be more courses coming in this series of webinar. And the next one will be on 11, May 11th. And then we will talk about quality of marine uh, material uh, and also rest raw materials. So stay tuned, you will get some information about this. Uh, we will also have in August a presentation of a different PhD projects uh, within ingredient and, and seafood. And also uh, coming up in this uh, November about analysis and in December probably about uh, regulations and, and conservation. So more topics to come. So uh, I think this will be great. So last but not finally, we are part of Bioprost today. And I would strongly recommend you to follow the program of Biopros. And tomorrow at 12 o'clock, I think it's a perfect uh, new step uh, based on what we looked into today, because then uh, there will be a discussion and presentation on how to turn science into solutions for society. And this is in, in an event uh, together with Biopros that we do with uh, the Life Science Cluster, our cluster, and also Biotech North. So there will be a moderator from the life science cluster and we will learn from companies like Colonus, Aqua Biomarine and STEAM on how um, the transition between academic uh, and scientific knowledge is towards the industry. So definitely go and join this uh, session as well. I recommend that. So, but thank you, first of all, for a great day. And uh, 
I, I love all this um, dedicated scientists that you're doing a great job also for the industry. So we just need to turn it into wonderful solutions so we can increase value of this wonderful food that we have in our ocean. So thank you all for today. And thank you, Janne, and thanks to Janira also. Yeah, thank you, Venke. So we are waiting for you in our next webinars that are coming and next that Venke has already mentioned will be in May. So I'm looking forward. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, it will be in Norwegian, but uh, I hope you will enjoy. We will uh, try to make it fun. I think it will be, yeah. Good. Yeah. So thank thanks you. To all. Thanks to all. Bye. Bye-bye.